Hi everybody and welcome. Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, wherever you are in the world. I'm absolutely delighted to be welcoming today's speaker, Professor Valentina Vitali. Um, but before that, um, I want to acknowledge the Indigenous land caretakers. The Centre for India and South Asia, CESA at UCLA, acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Hanuk Vetam, the ancestors, Ahihiram, elders, and Eu Hinkam, our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. Before I introduce Valentina, I would like to say a big thank you to Jamaica Villegas, who has handled the whole practical side of this so, so well, to Bharat Venkat and Akhil Gupta, um, who are also working on, on CISA and events this year. So um, thank you so much, Professor Vitali, for coming here today, for coming here today and, uh, and talking to us. Um, Professor Vitali is a, an eminent scholar, um, um, film studies. She's professor of film studies at the University of East London, director of the Moving Image Research Centre and independent film programmer. She's taught film history and theory for over 20 years and her research explores from a comparative perspective, perspective the relation between history, economics and film aesthetics. Professor Vitali has published widely on South and East Asian cinemas and on the relation between cinema and nation, on image-based work by women and on aspects of Indian visual cultural production. So just to name a couple of her, her publications, Capital and Popular Cinema, The Dollars Are Coming, it's a 2016 book, and Hindi Action Cinema, Industries, Narratives, Bodies, 2008, uh, that was incredibly pioneering work on, on um, action cinema in India. And uh, Theorizing National Cinema, 2006, that was co-edited with Paul Willeman. She's curated um, numerous events as well, Contemporary Women Filmmakers in South Asia, The Writerly and The Retrospective Ali Saeed. So, um, uh, uh, a wonderful body of research, interdisciplinary, um, covering several continents. Um, thank you so much for being here. And um, over to you. So um, Professor Valentina Vitali will speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll have a QA. and a Okay, over to you, Valentina. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for the, for the introduction. Thank you, Akhil and Bharat for the invitation and thank you Jamaica for the in for the assistance the assistance i i want to start this webinar with an observation and a question now unlike in india in pakistan in bangladesh in myanmar in bhutan and afghanistan there is no film industrial infrastructure as such so what i'm going to do here is outline the way women filmmakers working in these countries deal with the difficulties this creates. And um, I am also um, want to ask a question. And the question is, Jamaica, if you could put um, slide three up, please. Thank you. So how does this challenging situation tally with the fact that the number of women filmmakers on the ground is comparatively um, is comparatively high. If you could put slide three, not slide one. Uh, thank you. Yes. So, how does this situation, the difficulties on the ground, how does it tally with the fact that there are actually quite um, a lot of women making films in Bhutan, well, especially in Myanmar and in Afghanistan? So, I will try to answer that question by introducing some of these filmmakers, by outlining the context in which they work, and showing three clips of their films. And I'm hoping that the clip will enable us to discuss these women's work and the way they, they make films and also why they make films. Now, I'm going to start with Myanmar, 
because it is the only one, you can stop the, the, the slide if you want, um, Jamaica. Um, I want to start with uh, Myanmar because it is the only one of the three countries I discuss here that did have a film industry at some point. By the 1930s, there were Burmese owned cinemas in the countries and producers, in fact, quite a lot of producers. If you could show slide four, <clears throat> this slide four coming up shows the Bazia cinema in um, Yangon, which was built in the colonial period. And as you can see, it's, it's quite an old cinema. Unfortunately, now it's used as a um, it's used as a parking. What killed cinema off in Myanmar in the 1980s was, yes, video, like in, in other countries, the introduction, the gradual introduction of the VCR had quite an effect and impact on cinema. But in the case, in the specific case of Myanmar, what really made an impact, a negative impact, was the closed door policy of the state after 1988 and the movement of that year. Now, from 2010, and with the National League for Democracy's victory in, in the 2015 elections, things have uh, begun to pick up again, to pick up again um, in as far as cinemas is concerned. Even so, there is currently no government support for filmmakers. There are, however, two training institutions. The first is the Department of Cinema and Drama of the National University of the Arts and Culture, NUAC, which is starved, or starved of resources. And the second one, perhaps um, more effective, is the Yangon Film School, which is effective, but also in, in very precarious situation. The school was set up by the Anglo-Burmese filmmaker, Lindsay Marison, and relies, and that's why it's in a precarious situation, because it relies on adopt European funding as a school. Also very important, and um, Jamaica, if you could pull up the first website of the Watan Film Festival, um, also very important is the Watan Film Festival, of which you will see the um, website shortly, which is for all intent, not, not this one, um, not the slide, but the the website. Now the Bhutan Film Festival is for all intents and purposes the only film festival operating in Myanmar. It has been operating for 10 years, which is quite a miracle, I think. Now also very important, and I'll return to the festival shortly, um, also very important for the filmmakers operating on the ground, making films there, are NGOs and NGOs um, are a kind of a lifeline for filmmakers because they commission documentaries. So that they're, they, they're really important. Now, who are the women filmmakers in, in, uh, in um, Myanmar? Now, since the Yangon Film School opened in 2005, around 50 women, five zero women have enrolled and made films in the school, at the school. One of these, and I need fa uh, slide five, one of these is Chi Piu Shin, who was born in 1975 and has made films and video since 1995. So she started making films and videos before the school was open but she then returned um, to the school, yeah. This is Chi Piu Shin with a poster of her latest film. Now, today she's also involved in politics and she's a member of the Central Committee for the National League for Democracy. And she's also on the board of the Myanmar Motion Picture Organization. Of the same generation is Myanmar Chinese Shin Dawe, on slide six, who worked as an underground video journalist during the dictatorship 
um, and started making documentaries in 1998. Now, until recently, she also ran the Yangon Film Services, which is the production arm of the um, Yangon Film School and also one of the main production, film production hubs in the country. You can see Shindawe, Now I Am 13, on YouTube for free. It's a short documentary, but a very um, impressive one. Um, of a part of a younger generation is Tutu Shane on slide seven. Yes, Tutu Shane was born in Yangon in 1983. She's a graduate of the National University Cinema and Drama Department, and then joined the school, the, the, the Yangon Film School in 2005. Two years later, with a scholarship, she studied filmmaking at the National Academy in Prague. So she, she came to Europe, and then when she returned to Myanmar in 2011, she co-founded the Watan Film Festival. And she's an interesting filmmaker because she's not just a filmmaker, she's also someone sizely who, um, who is involved in the festival. Um, and she also set up Third Floor Productions, which is um, a production company producing uh, documentaries by local independent filmmakers. I want to show you a clip by a film that was made by um, Tutu Shane, directed by Tutu Shane in 2006 um, and released in 2007. She, um, the soundtrack, which is quite impressive, is also um, the work of a woman filmmaker, Lei Tida, who also passed by the school. She's slightly older. She's a really interesting filmmaker too. Now, A Million Threads is a short documentary about an annual competition that takes place in Yangon every year, where women weave, compete to weave the best robes for the statues of the Buddha in Yangon's main pagoda. And of course, they, they, it's, it's, it's prestigious, it's quite a, it's quite a feat, and um, there is a financial reward. It's a whole event. You will see from, from the clip that this is, is quite, quite something. It's just on the five minutes short, the clip. So um, Jamaica, if you could please uh, screen it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. I'm, I really like this film, this short film, I think it's really impressive, but we'll return to it at the end um, when, um, yes, at the end of the talk. I want to move on to Bhutan, where we have a very different situation, of course. It's a, smart, it's a, it's a much smaller place. Um, now definitely even more, definitely more democratic than Myanmar, but also from a media perspective, also historically more isolated than Myanmar um, from a media perspective. There was no media industry until the second half of the 1990s really in Bhutan and television broadcasting only started in 1999. This May, makes it a very interesting ground for filmmakers, for the new generation of filmmakers, uh, because it's an open ground. Um, at the same time, they have no production infrastructure. They have no distribution infrastructure. They have to distribute the films themselves domestically and also often show them themselves in traveling cinemas, in open cinemas and so. There is also no training infrastructure or structure but unlike in Myanmar, in Bhutan, cinema does receive a measure of support from the, from, from the government. However, by and large, filmmakers survive on the basis of a very lively, young, local network of support and the, the relative political opening, the, 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 the measure of democracy in the country means that they can, they can and do operate in groups with initiatives aimed not only at production, but also at creating an audience for debate around Bhutan cinema, Bhutanese films, um, a domestic audience, and, and, and eventually also we will see an international audience. So this is extremely important um, in, in this kind of working together in, in groups, in networks. <clears throat> now, who are the women filmmakers in Bhutan? There is on slide eight, please, Jamaica. Um, Kesang Chuki Dorji, who is a documentary maker. She's a journalist. She's director of KCD Productions, which make largely educational films. She's also an MP on the National Council for, um, a member of parliament for the National Council of Bhutan. Of a younger generation, um, slide nine, please, is Dechen Roda. She's a Timpu based filmmaker. She's also the co-founder of the Beskop Cheshu Film Festival. And if you could, Jamaica, 
uh, pull up the website of the festival. Fair website number two. So the Bes Beskop Cheshu Film Festival. Um, she also set up the, as you can see, it's an open air film festival. Um, Deschenroder also set up um, a production company, Dakini Production. And interestingly, more recently, a streaming um, service where you can buy films from Bhutan. I have the links at the end of this PowerPoint, of my PowerPoint, where you can, where you can see where the streaming service, the address of the streaming service. Now, Dachshund Roder is not trained as a filmmaker. She started by making music videos, advertisements, and eventually documentaries for the newborn Bhutan TV. Um, eventually, she also started making short fiction films, which were then followed by a feature length film entitled Honey Giver Among the Dogs, of which you just caught a glimpse on the slide of um, the poster. The film was released in 2016. It was co-produced by Beridian Entertainment, which is quite a big Hong Kong producer, and distributed by a European French distributor, Premium Films. So a very different ballgame from the short films that she made, that the Chen Roda made before, which are, however, in my opinion, rougher, yes, but also more interesting as, as films. And from a women's cinema perspective, I think more interesting um, for that too. It is one of those films I want to show you a clip of. Um, it's, uh, this is a short film by Dechen Roda, made in 2015. <clears throat> it's called Three Year, Three Month Retreat. And the title refers to the Buddhist practice of retreat to achieve um, clarity, wisdom. In this case, it applies to the period, the three years spent in prison by the, the protagonist, the, a young wounded woman um, whom we suspect was either abused or somehow um, possibly raped. It's not clear, it's not shown um, at the beginning of the film. Um, anyway, she ends up in prison and the clip starts the moment when she is released at the end of these three years at the end of which she seems to have gained um, um, a measure of clarity, if you call it, which leads to little consequences at the end of the film. I won't spoil it for you. Um, the, the interesting thing is that she doesn't, the, the protagonist doesn't say a word throughout the film. Other people speak about her, but she never speaks. If you could, Jamaica, please show clip number two. I'm not doing it. 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 Churani, <laughs>
ตุสินซินาเดดิโลซุมเดจียาซิมุชิมิมิพิโดเจียมอไอเอพานิดิพามิเตมุอิมเมทิเบอดะชิชิเมนะตะจิดะมิซุกิคาเดบะคะตามิน
filmmakers work in group in Afghanistan, especially be, um, well, they, they, they work in group and they do more than just film production. Um, and this is because the sheer fact of making films in Afghanistan is a form of political activism and a dangerous activity too. Here, I want to mention three women, three women filmmakers. The first one on uh, slide number 10, please, Jamaica, um, is Saba Sahar. Saba Sahar, who was a theater actress. She was also recently the subject of a gun attack, um, an attack on her life. Anyway, during the Taliban regime, she left Kabul. She returned to Kabul after in 2001, and she trained as a policewoman and founded Saba Film, the production house through which, by, with which she made Kanun, the law, a film um, um, made in 2004, in, where, in, in which she, she features as a woman in an action role. And the film was a major success. It also circulated clandestinely. And since Sahar has made Commissioner Amanullah, which is a television series for the Afghan, about the Afghan police, who st which stars again Saba Sahar in an action role. She's a very interesting um, figure. A very different filmmaker is Roya Sadat on slide 11 who stayed in Afghanistan during the Taliban rule and um, started making films um, after. She makes fictions and documentary films via her own company called Roya Film House. She was also um, involved in the organization of the Women Film Festival in Herat. And she distributes her films either via festivals, like the one on slide 12, which is called um, A Letter to the President, is a fiction film that was circulated by a festival, but she also, you can find her films on YouTube, the earlier films like Three Dots or Playing the Tar. So you, you'll find those for free on, on YouTube. The filmmaker I want to focus on, which I is my favorite of these three, is Diana Sakeb on slide 13 who trained as a filmmaker in, uh, at the Tehran University of Art. She returned to Kabul after the, the, the fall of the Taliban regime and set up a company, her own film production company called Mardumak Media. She also set up a network called Basa Film, um, also known as Afghanistan Cinema Club, which produces films, um, yeah, produces films, used to run film training courses um, in Afghanistan. I'm not sure they still do. I don't think they still do. Um, it used to support foreign production companies coming to Afghanistan to shoot. It sends filmmakers work to international film festival and organized large cultural events in Kabul, like the, human, the Autumn Human Rights Film Festival. If you could, Jamaica, show the website of the festival. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's organized with uh, Diana Sakeb's partner. Um, yeah. So Sakeb, Diana herself, and her group also launched a film magazine called Theme. And Diana makes, um, she's also a prominent um, women's rights activist. She makes documentaries, she makes films, essay films, and she does that with some support from, minimal support from European film festivals. Um, I, su I suspect primarily with her own funding. She distributed them, used to distribute them via Vimeo On Demand. Um, or otherwise via festivals. And my last and next clip is from Diana Sakev's Motarama, which was released in 2013, but which was made during in a particular context. And the context is 
um, the decision of the Afghan parliament in 2009 to approve the Shia family law, which restricted very, very severely um, women's freedom. Afghan women who were against the law protested in front of Afghanistan's biggest religious school, where the law was, had been drafted. And of course, the protests turned violent. Even so, this was one of the major, first major movements by Afghan women for the rights. And at the time, the filmmaker Diana Sakib traveled to various um, Afghan cities to learn about the concerns of educated Afghan women about lack of rights, uh, domestic violence, street harassment, etc., but also to learn about their hopes and expectations from the women's movement. Um, the clip is self-explanatory, it's just over five minutes, and um, if you could play it, um, Jamaica, please. Thank you. Iliam, a mu harakat hom khili mu dawe mu pay bastanis. Iliam, a mu harakat hom khili mu dawe mu pay bastanis. Hich kudo mazizan haz vaziyat ki doshtan rozi na kudan va. به نوعی همگی و دنبال ایجاد تغییراتی در زندگی خودشان در زندگی شخصی و اجتماعیشان بودن ولی که چرا هیچ کسی هیچ کاری نمیکنه و بحث قربانی شدن و قربانی دادن است که خب هر کدام اینو فکر میکنن هر کس که اولین قدم رو برداره او قربانی است و چرا من قربانی باشم چرا یک زن دیگه نباشه چرا من حرکت کنم که زنهای دیگه استفاده کنن از او تبعات کاری که من انجام دادم
شما واقعا طرف دار زن های او خشونتی که در غرب در شرق نیه دوای چتی میزنن بعد برگشتن دریم توف کردن واقعا ناراحت هستم توف کردن دو حالت اومد از میگیره پرچم پایین بود پرچم پایین بود خیلی کارش خیلی اشتباه است تمام مردمو تحریک کردن چون دیگه هم گرفتن چون دیگه گرفت خوبه کسای دیگه طرف نشون نزدیک میشد اون موقع امنیت اصلا نبود که بگیره امنیت هم. هی مردم میگفتن قشنگ در لای زالا راه میرفتن هر کاری دلشون میخواستن میکردن Now I'd be very interesting to to hear your thoughts and impressions about this and and the other two clips. Um, so what I'm going to do is to close it here and to and return to my opening question. Um, if you could um, pull up uh, slide number fourteen, please, um, Jamaica. Thank you. <clears throat> so I want to close by trying to answer the question that I put to you at the beginning and say that generally the less the less um structure the film industry the less corporate the less financed the more open it is also to to women um, and this has obviously huge practical disadvantages but it also results in what i call a cinema of the commons a cinema which is based on grassroots friendship relations um, a cinema which is open which is aesthetically quite innovative, made also by women, and usually politically quite sharp. I think this comes across quite well in Motorama by Diana Sekeb and her partner. At, it, strangely, absurdly, the more it is as if the more oppressive, the more precarious the situation faced by the filmmaker, the more innovative the film, as if the language of realism, the language of mainstream cinema was not adequate to, to, to present the complexity of the situations confronted by, by these by this women in, in each of the three countries, I think. The, the other observation I want to make is that in the specific cases considered here, and you can stop the, the uh, slide, um, Jamaica, thank you. In the specific cases considered here, the difficult circumstances faced by filmmakers in Myanmar, in Myanmar, in Bhutan, and in Afghanistan produced, seem to have produced a woman's cinema that is sustained by the urgency to address the condition of women. It is an urgency that pushes women like Saba Sahar and Raya Sadat and, and so to take up any media they can, including film, to address the, the, the situation. And it is an urgency that perhaps um, riskily and controversially, I would argue is not felt as much in, in Europe and in the United States where cinema is not only more corporate, um, but also seen as a profession, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an art, as a hobby, um, rarely as a need. Now, the urgency felt in these countries, along with the openness of non-corporate uh, commons cinema, explains, I think, the larger number of women making films in countries where one least expects them to be able to. So I want to leave it at that and only draw your attention to a couple of resources 
Um, for any of you who want to know more about this, um, this, this, um, the work of these women, if you could, Jamaica, show slide number 15, which shows, um, well, you can find more information on a special issue of Bioscope, the South Asian Screen Studies Journal. Um, there's an issue um, published in June last year, which is entirely devoted to women filmmakers in South Asia, with interviews by, with some of these filmmakers I profiled here, but also with um, specialist essays, well, especially commissioned essays by um, specialists in, in the various cinemas I discussed here. Um, and also the next slide, no, actually not the next, but the next one again. Yeah, so you can also check out these links where you find some of the films, um, you can download them either for free or or for a for a very small amount of money, like some in some cases less than five dollars, or otherwise you can check out the um, festivals websites again. Um, this is more. This is all for me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention, and let's open it up for comments, questions, and discussion, especially about the clips. Thank you so much, Valentina. That was that was absolutely fantastic. Um, just <laughs> I'm still absorbing it all. Um, just seeing all this stuff, these outer reaches of South Asia, and it brings me back to um, you know when we're both working on on Hindi cinema, which was not particularly usual in the early 2000s, um, and then you know not particularly usual and and working on on mainstream, you know what mm. Bollywood now and now. You know, Myanmar, Burma, Afghanistan, and women filmmakers. It's just incredible how the field has has progressed. Um, so, and, and and I mean, your and your work. So that's anyway. There's a million things I would love to ask, but I don't want to hog the place. But I did just want to say, um, uh, Valentin, you have um, you have taught in Myanmar. You've worked with filmmakers um, at one of those schools. I okay. I was. I didn't work with them, but I did teach. Uh, I was invited to teach um, mm -hmm. a film course, a film history course at the Yangon Film School. That was after I visited um, Yangon and to find out about who who were the women making films there. And I um, I had met the um, director of the school, Lindsay Marison. Um, at a film festival in Europe. We had left it at the time, a few years ago, that I would try and do something with my students and her students, uh, we, which we never managed to, but eventually I managed to visit the school, which is really, really impressive. I mean, 50 women um, passed through that school, were trained at that school, which is, you know, the more, I mean, if you compare these with the um, with the Film and Television Institute in India, which I also visited and I, I, I um, talked to the women there, there were four women out of 120, <laughs> 120 um, students, you know, this is, so what they're doing in Myanmar around the YFS, the Yangon Film School, is quite remarkable. Um, the, they have this very strict policy where they um, recruit 12 students every year, so six women, six men, or identifying as women, identifying as men, and mm. try to recruit as much as possible from the ethnic minorities of uh, Myanmar. So it's a very interesting project, and unfortunately it's always depending on on you know, precarious funding, which you never know whether it comes or so. I was invited to following a couple of lectures I did there when I was when I visited I was invited to give this film history course over three weeks and it's extraordinary how um, inventive young filmmakers can be some are young some are less young um, in spite of the fact that there is really a shortage of resources but also a shortage of films to see right um, it's very difficult I was teaching 
about films that my students have seen because they circulate here and so, but obviously if you're sitting in Myanmar, it's way more difficult to get hold of them. Mm. So it was very interesting, yes, to, to, to work with that. And I hope that um, the school manages to survive this particularly nasty turn of events. Yeah, indeed. That's another thing. Oh, it's completely fascinating and, and very heartening. Um, and I also just wanted to mention that the, the Bioskips Specialist you is, is edited by you. <laughs> yes, surprise. You modestly didn't mention that. So that is... Um, uh, it's, it's guest edited by me, but it's the articles um, in it, the essays are written. For instance, the, the essay on, on Afghanistan is written, it's a visual essay by um, mm -hmm. a filmmaker who has worked in, well, she's German, but she has worked also mm -hmm. in, in Lebanon. And she, I asked her to do it because she, to, to write that essay, because she worked with filmmakers on the ground in Afghanistan in 2009 and, and earlier. Um, she made some really interesting work with them, um, including um, public events, featuring their films, including the films by Saba Sahar, Mm -hmm. which are quite something. Um, I managed to see a few of um, Commissioner Amanullah, which if, if, you, if you look very hard on YouTube, you might find snippets of it. It's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting. So yeah, the essays are, are commissioned and written by people who are specialists in particular, um, national cinema, Bangladesh, Pakistan, etc. <laughs> That has remind me to uh, um, renew my uh, subscription to Bioscope. <laughs> okay, so, and just, I mean, the films are just beautiful. Okay, so um, questions. Have we, we've already got one, something in the, in the Q&A. Um, Isha, so um, can we, uh, would you like to, we can make you visible and audible and you can speak out your own question. Uh, yes, Jamaica, please. can you do that? Invite Isha to who also works on, on women filmmakers in uh, South Asia. Mm -hmm. I think on, yeah. Uh, uh, she's muted. Yeah. Oh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, could I not have the video, you know? Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, well, I had actually, yeah, I sent uh, a couple of questions and uh, wonderful uh, talk thank you so much it was so informative so uh, you know insightful i loved it thank you yeah, yeah, thank I, you. Uh, yeah I had two very different questions one was uh, one is on mahatma the last you know the last uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know the afghan uh, yeah, uh, film thing. yes uh, yeah. I would love to hear your thoughts more, you know, uh, if you could speak to the alternation mm. of the performance, you know, the, uh, the bodily acts yeah. of the women, you know, there's a performance going on and, uh, and the protest itself, which is very realistic. So it's like a couple of different aesthetics are being juxtaposed and I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, you know the political uh, resonances of each and both and how uh, uh, contextually and how they are speaking to one another and also you know connected to you know sort of the context of Talibanization uh, which is of course which of course goes back to the Cold War and all of that has that been addressed at all in uh, the um, in the in, in the scope in the aesthetic scope but that was one one of my questions about Mahatma and very different one was about the you know the film festivals which are so valuable it seems you know to get to uh, help the flourishing of these films uh, could they be uh, are they non-corporate you know so if you could speak a little bit to the corporate or non-corporate aspect of the film festivals. That was my very different question. So these were my two questions. Right. So perhaps uh, the, the first one, which is the second one, I'll answer the second one, which is the easiest. Um, there are, so the, the, the festivals, uh, the, 
Watan Film Festival is one of two uh, film festivals in Myanmar that I know of and that I've been, um, I, I think I'm right because I've had conversations with Lindsay Madison on this and with the, with the people in the school. Um, the, the, the other festival, which was a human rights film festival, was, um, didn't last very long in Myanmar. And this is before what happened in February in the coup and, and everything. Um, there was another film festival, which, um, well, basically the director of the festival is languishing in prison as we speak mm. and has been there for the last um, quite a few years. Okay. This, okay. Is, this is the Watan Film Festival, which is mm. uh, um, managed to survive and um, clearly not corporate. Mm. Um, uh, set up by um, Tutu Shane and other people um, of her generation and probably getting a little bit of support from things like the um, Goethe film, the, the Goethe Institute, which is quite mm -hmm. active in Yangon. Hmm? Mm -hmm. and I, 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 I'm not sure. So it really is one of those very precarious, but very, very important things. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, I don't know much about the Afghan Film Festival, apart from the fact that it's run, it's part of a larger network of filmmakers, um, including um, Diana Sakeb's partner and Roya Sadat, I think, and, and so, and I'm not sure they're still operating. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely not corporate. The, the other festival is uh, the one perhaps I know a little bit more, which is the one in Bhutan, the best cop, Cheshu. That is again the initiative of, of people like the Chen Roda. Mm -hmm. And it did, I had in conversation, I interviewed her and in conversation with her, she was telling me that they do everything. Um, it's definitely not corporate in the sense that the filmmakers make the films, show the films, invite other filmmakers to, to, to show them. Um, they, they sell the tickets. <laughs> <laughs> in the main square, then the audience goes up to them and says, oh, wonderful, you know, we want to talk about it. So it's, it's, but you know, Bhutan is small, so you can do that and, and sustain it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's definitely a, a, a labor of love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely not corporate. Um, mm -hmm. that, that, um, so that's what I meant, as opposed to festivals like we know them here, mm, which are mm -hmm. a really different thing. Um, the aesthetics of Motorama, or how um, the Diana Sekep films, I it's it's of the three films I showed is my favorite because I can see the filmmaker grabbing everything she can think of, mm -hmm. every device film can offer to um, to convey the sense of 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 um, anger. Um, urgency, the need, and there's a, the, the, the exasperation of wanting to say, look, you know, I'm here, I've got the right to be here. And so she, she uses everything. She uses a school performance. She uses yeah. long interviews yeah. in the film. She uses a kind of interior monologue or in a mo interior yeah. monologue kind of approach, which is typical of the essay film. She uses the aesthetics of the, the kind of, um, um, the Agitprop uh, mm. documentary, yeah, and and she uses these classic documentary where you just go on a side. But what is interesting about it mm. is that this is not a film who try, which tries to represent the women's struggle in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. It's a film that is part and parcel of that struggle. No? And what, it, what the reason I like it, I like it, is because you can see that in the in the mode of address of the film in the aesthetics, um, you have written on it uh, the, the fact that the filmmaker was there, that it was difficult to shoot it, that they had to do it, probably some, some aspects of it, they had to do it um, hiding because you, oh. there is a moment in the film when she says she doesn't even um, dare to drive a car mm -hmm. without her, um, her scarf on and, and stuff mm -hmm. because it, it makes her too um, too vulnerable to attacks and therefore so there's there's all sorts of difficulties that crop up 
Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes the sound is a bit weird and you realize that it has to do with the fact that they're shooting in a very precarious situation. Mm-hmm. I love that film because of that, mm-hmm. because it's, it's so rough that it's, the struggle is written on it. As it's, mm-hmm. it's part of it. Mm-hmm. And that's really all I want to say about the aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Except perhaps that um, it's a film that makes it totally impossible for the spectator, for the audience to exoticize the women, to mm-hmm. aestheticize the situation. Mm-hmm. You're just grabbed by the neck and, 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 and you're there with these women feeling sorry because they're being spat at. Mm-hmm. And not feeling sorry, but feeling angry. Um, so you're, you're involved in a way that makes it really impossible for you to, to, to be patronizing, I think, mm-hmm. in some way or another. Okay, okay, that's wonderful because you know you both in uh, your uh, response to the film festival, uh, uh, corporate corporateness or not, and the other you're really t- excavating sort of a ke- guerrilla form of filmmaking. It seems to me mm. both in the way the film festivals are coming together, that are sort of interstitial to the you know, sort of the more corporate Western structures of film festival. And and also in, you know, this, you know, as you described the way she, uh, Mahatrama came together, you know, how she even did the filming, just the, you know, the phenomenology of the film, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, production practice. Both have this, this guerrilla aspect to it. That's very interesting. It's wonderful, actually. It's, it's yeah. really, it, it, it is really interesting. But what is interesting is also the fact that if you, I mean, I bought Motorama on, by video on demand. I, I saw other films by, by Diana Sakeb Schultz at a, at a festival in Locarno. Mm-hmm. And then I looked, I looked her up, I checked, I talked to other people, to this German filmmaker who had worked with her and, and, and bought the film. And what I find, um, quite extraordinary is also that there are moments when it's funny. Mm. Um, she has these interviews with these um, young, youngish, maybe 30, 35 year old women. And one of them is talking about having to wear the hijab. And she says, oh, I don't know what the hijab. So they, they, go and buy, they go and buy one and they're there negotiating with, with, the, with the seller. Uh, whether whether he's got a smaller one and even a smaller one, even a smaller one. <laughs> so, or otherwise, the conversation with these women, um, there, there's there's aspects of it which are funny. They are they are really energizing, right? So you can't. It's not it's not a tragic film. It's a film full of energy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it is a guerrilla thing. Um, I think it's just too dangerous for that in some mm. respects. I Someone see. like Saba Sahar in Afghanistan, she's she's in a way that's that's both mainstream, well mainstream, kind of mainstream, and mm. um guerrilla because she's really out there on a motorbike with a gun and she she mm. plays the whole action role number. Mm-hmm. That's much more in your face. Mm. This one are, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, whether it's a guerrilla film or not, it's, but it's an interesting idea, yeah. Mm. Well, Thank you for your questions, they were great questions. <laughs> no, it was, it's been a, a wonderful presentation. I okay. also have a question about the Weaver uh, a film, you know, the first one, but maybe, you know, if, uh, I, I can. Well, another come question, but let's come back to you, Isha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Ravinder Singh. Um, we can we can make you audible and visible, or one or the other, um, if you'd like to speak out your own question. Actually, while you do that, I was. Um, yeah, the whole thing is making me think back to the days where I haven't sort of been thinking about this since, but in India, there was always that contrast, you know, art cinema versus commercial cinema. So, you know, art cinema shown at festivals, kind of, 
you know, slow and boring versus, you know, the commercial film people didn't like it, slow and boring, focus on Hello. poverty versus commercials. Anyway, let's come back to that. Ravinder, uh, Ravinder Singh, please. Hello, Ravinder. Professor Malcolm, un uh, unfortunately, I cannot hear you. Oh, that's odd. Is my is my voice not coming out clearly? I can hear you. I I can hear you very well. Ah. Yeah. yeah. No. Please, please go ahead with your question. Yeah. So uh, thank you uh, for this wonderful presentation, Professor Vitali. Uh, my question is, I mean, given the fact that these women are making films amidst political strife and are overtly politically engaged, how does uh, studying their work as an academic located in the West implicate the researcher in their politics, if at all? Also, what kind of emotional investment and ethical commitment does researching these women filmmakers require, especially when one belongs to the same gender? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, the easy one, which is the second one, is, is in terms of emotional investment um, as, a, as, a, as a woman, as a feminist, um, for me the investment is, is um, for quality investment, it's, it's, it's curiosity. I want to find out, I really want to know who is making, um, what moves these women to, to, to make these films. I mean, the idea that you can, that you, that, that as, a, as a woman and a feminist, you're sitting in Afghanistan and you have the courage to make a film, for me, is something that is, is, is extraordinary. And as I wanted to find out about this, when I first saw the films in festivals and no one had written about it, I found one or two people who could tell me something about it, I thought I'd try and find out what I could find out. In the case of Afghanistan, I had to go by um, someone who had worked with the women there. Um, but in the case of Myanmar, I was able to, I was lucky enough to go there, work with them, talk, to, well, spend time with them and talk. Hmm? And of course, as a white middle class person, you're always feeling very uncomfortable. Well, you're uncomfortable. You, you wonder what the hell are you doing there? Um, but then um, I think I am more worried that people about by people who are not interested than people who are interested. In other words, yes, as a, as a white middle class person, what kind of a place do I Occupy and what are the politics of that? But then, um, you know, what are the politics of people in my, from my background, who are not interested at all, right? So in a way, it's 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 um, it's as a film historian, I think it's 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 not a matter of duty; it's a matter of responsibility. Um, you write. Uh, I was interested, I started with Indian films when Anna was saying, um, you know, I, rem I remember when I put in an application to write about Indian films to, to do a PhD on it. And I was told by the British Academy that was not a suitable subject for research. That was in 1997. <clears throat> um, nowadays, uh, Mercifully, for lots of people are writing about Hindi films and Indian films. So I moved to look about, to look at the, the periphery. Huh? What is outside Bollywood? What is outside India? Why isn't anyone talking about it? Um, there must be filmmakers making films there. So this is, I just really scratched the surface in that bioscope issue. Um, and I hope that other people are gonna pick it up. People who can speak the language for starters, which I can't. And so, I hope that somehow answers in a kind of messy way your question. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor. Uh, any other questions <clears throat> currently? I know Isha has one hanging and I would love to ask a bit of, um, okay, I don't see any more right now. So I wanted to, yes, there's the, you know, art versus commercial cinema. So you're talking about now filmmaking as a need you know, rather than it's, you know, about being a, what, a profession, an art, 
you a know, hobby. a hobby. Yeah. Mm. And just this idea, I mean, I'm sure I'm not up to date with this literature at all, but I'm, uh, people are surely re completely rethinking the idea of art cinema, because I mean, early art cinema was, you know, elite, significant social elites. And with, you know, greater accessibility from technology, um, you've got all these, you know, micro, you know, kind of, uh, well, industry is the wrong word, but sort of um, people making films. And I mean, I know in Tibet as well, you've got just, you know, people making terribly sort of grassroots films. And, you know, so it's just, um, so I sus suspect the whole, you know, I mean, surely people have thought this through, this this old commercial art divide and, and sort of increasingly yeah. currently. Yeah, I love it definitely. And, and, you know, you have, um, you have people who since the 1980s have been talking about third cinema um, as, as one of those, um, as, as a type of cinema that is neither the art film, it's neither the commercial one, but it's a cinema, it's an imperfect cinema, it's a poor cinema, it's a cinema that is very much rooted in the there and, and then of when it was made, the history, the politics of the place and so. Um, you have people who speak, um, but I, I mean, as I, again, as a film historian, I'm, I'm so not interested in these um, one, two, three categories. For me, it really is about um, the limits imposed on individual filmmakers mm. and how the filmmakers move within those limits. Mm. The problem with mainstream cinema, or if there is such a thing, is that often the limits imposed are so narrow that the poor filmmakers can barely get to do what they want to do. Mm? And what comes out is something that is only answering the, the priorities of the producers and the, the people who put the money in. So that's when it becomes, so you could talk about something like Sabah Sahar's films as films that are totally paying lip service to the mainstream. Mm? So there, there are kind of television series about an action woman, about a woman, police woman, who goes around kicking asses, etc. Um, they, they pay lip service to that, but they're, they're really interesting yeah. because in that context, they make absolutely sense. They're made with, uh, with very little money, I suspect. And um, I would give anything to be able to see Kanoon, which I haven't been able to see in, in its entirety. So that is probably something that comes close to mainstream cinema, but I love it, you know, just as much as I love something like Motrama that we saw. They're both, um, you can hear the filmmaker's presence there and the place, the, the circumstances it inhabits, you know, in both instances. <clears throat> I was just going to comment that Bhutan and um, Bhutanese films are quite, uh, it was when I was researching Tibetan pop music in Nepal, I guess 2014 mm. or so, there are a lot of, you know, people watching Bhutanese films, so Tibetans in Nepal, probably Nepalese as well, and they were seen as this kind of, kind of, I mean, t Tibetan exiles didn't have their own cinema, they weren't watching films coming from Tibet, so these were almost kind of mainstream sort of films were coming from Bhutan, which is a, a tiny, tiny place, but interesting because it's a, you know, a Tibetan language, one of the Tibetan language, uh, you know, um, a sort of not a dialect, but it relates, it's one of the larger group of Tibetan, tibeto burman languages. So it was quite interesting and people telling me that I, I met a composer who was um, doing music, he'd go off to Bhutan and, and do scores for Bhutanese films, as well as doing Tibetan pop music, which earned him absolutely no money whatsoever. But that there wasn't, there wasn't a piracy problem there because Bhutan is compared to certainly Nepal, you know, much more orderly country, mm -hmm. um, small population and, and so on. So I found that quite interesting. It seemed to be Bhutan feeding into a larger kind of Tibetan world where you're getting feature films. Apparently, for, for films, there's also a kind of a connection with Japan for some reason. Bhutan. 
but I, I'm not, I don't really know. There are much. a lot of connections. It's also the sort of Buddhist and, and a lot of Japanese scholars of, of Tibetan or interested in Tibetan Buddhism, perhaps. Mm, yeah. I mean, the filmmaker, the Chen Roda, she, she discovered that she loved cinema when she spent some, um, a very short period, well, a, a year, I think, in, in, um, in New York as a young woman. Her mother is a writer. Um, so she comes from a, a particular background. Um, and I think all of the women I, I taught, um, perhaps with the exception of Tutu Shane and the Myanmar, Myanmar ones, um, who come from different backgrounds, but definitely in Afghanistan and in Bhutan, the, the class background is very clear, right? So we're not talking about... Um, so yeah, New York, she is, the Chen Roda discovered that she loved New York. She discovered a video shop there she used to spend like, and then managed to, to um, well, her friends gave her a camera and she started as a present when she left and then she started shooting films. But to return to the other question of the, to, to the previous question of the mainstream and so, it's interesting to compare the films that, the film that she made um, Honey Giver Among the Dogs, which is clearly a film aimed also at the film festival crowd, to the earlier ones. No? And I loved Honey Giver Among the Dogs, but I think it's not as effective as a cinema that raises issues, raises questions about women and so, than the very rough one of which I've shown the clip. If you do have a chance and twelve dollars to spare, do buy Honey Giver Among the Dogs <laughs> from Vimeo On Demand. I think you'll really like it. We have a couple more questions. One is on um, Bhutan, uh, Bhutanese films. Brian Young, who who does field work in Bhutan, please can we unmute and put a video on on Brian Young? And then we have a question from Behroz Shroff. And Isha has a question hanging. And we should be also thinking about letting you go at some stage. <laughs> Hi, thank you for addressing my question. Um, I joined late, I apologize. I was teaching a class, so I, I didn't hear your talk. Or I just saw previously you were doing something on Bhutan and I do field work in Bhutan, so I was really interested. Um, so I, I was just curious about what this Bhutanese movie that you you were talking about a little bit more about it since I missed yeah, yeah. so I, I think the best the best way of answering you corresponding to your comment here is to have a look at the last I think um, perhaps um, uh, Jamaica can pull up the last slide of my PowerPoint you'll find there some links where you can um, download, um, I can tell you exactly which link, is uh, I think slide 17. Yeah, so if you look at the one, two, three, four, um, oh, it's disappeared from my screen. I think it's the fourth, um, the fourth, uh, yeah, so the Best Cop Cheshu Air Film Festival but also best of films from Bhutan. If you go on Vimeo on demand, Vimeo and type in best of films from Bhutan, you will be able to download for prices ranging between $2 and $15 uh, films from Bhutan. Hmm? Right. And and they are made either by the Chen Roder or by the people she works with, or with, um, yes, yeah, so it's a very close, small network, I'm sure that working in Bhutan, you know. So check check those out if you don't know them already. Okay, no, no, I don't know them. And Honey Giver Among the Dogs is the most polished, but I think the short ones are also very interesting. Okay, great. Uh, Jamaica has put all these links, she's copied all these links into the chat, so everybody should be able to access them. And I was going to say this talk, it, it's probably, it probably will be available um, on UCLA CISA website 
after as well. So you'll be able to you'll be able to have a look at it there. I wanted to move on to uh, Behrouz Shroff. Yeah, um, uh, Jamaica, if you could stop the slides so that I can see. Oh, thank you. And can you make uh, Behrouz visible and audible? Mm, I don't, oh, oh yeah. Yeah, she is coming. Hello. Yes, hi. <laughs> Hello, Professor Vitali. I really love your work. I've been following your work from the time you've written about Hum Aapke Hain Kaun. Oh the, my God. <laughs> early Bollywood films that I teach. Um, my question, of course, has to do with the mainstreaming. You just mm. spoke about that. Um, and, and I'd like to know your thoughts in terms of how uh, mainstreaming can reach a wider audience and has the advantages in a way to make more and more people aware, particularly mm. in India, uh, yeah. of this situation uh, of women women's desires uh, and the changing roles of motherhood. Mm. And, and I put in chat the films, recent films, which you probably know, Dolly Kitty or Wo Chamakte Sitare mm. and uh, Lipstick Under My Burka by yeah. Anandita Srivastava. So yeah. I'd just like to know your thoughts on those. I, I like them. <laughs> I like them. I have... Um, it's a now the question of my streaming as if, if you know my work you know that I'm far from shying away from mainstream right. on anything that is is so um, it it it's it goes without saying that I I'm really interested in that I'm really interested in the fact that this is a cinema that reaches really really widely the problem arises in countries like Myanmar, in other words, outside of India, mm -hmm. in South Asia, in Myanmar, in Bhutan, and in Afghanistan. Well, I don't know about Afghanistan, but definitely in Bhutan, Dechen Roda was telling me that it's, she grew up watching bad VHS copies of um, American films or in other words, there is a difficulty in getting old of films, and especially now when we assume that everybody has broadband and all of that. Myanmar, Bhutan, Netflix is ostensibly reaching that, mm -hmm. those countries, but it's not really, because mm -hmm. the broadband doesn't sustain it. So when we're talking about mainstream, we're talking about a cinema that actually reaches a very, very thin layer of the population. Um, outside of India, at least, mm. and Bangladesh and Pakistan, um, probably Sri Lanka too. So the in in countries like Myanmar and so, who can afford Netflix? It's extraordinarily expensive, and it's even more expensive to have the broadband to to, to watch it. So what the, the, that is how you get a filmmaker like Dechen Roder or Tutu Shane trying to actually foster a cinema which is not mainstream as we understand it, but actually in those places reaches a wider audience through the festivals. And that is when it becomes interesting. Um, it's no longer, those categories like art cinema, um, art house, all that, they, they all fall apart because the distribution networks are not the ones that we know. Mm -hmm. Right. And also funding, I mean, to get through to even just post-production funding from something like the Hubert Bars Fund in Rotterdam, the Rotterdam Film Festival, has a post-production fund or even a fund for filmmakers from the Global South. Mm -hmm. So it's entirely devoted to them, but the hoops one has to go through to get that funding are enormous. And it comes, what comes to mind is a friend of mine and Anna, Minu Gaur, who was telling me that when she went to the Berlin Film Festival as part of a workshop 
in order to get the funding to make a next mainstream film, because she wants to make mainstream film and she does, she was told that, that she wanted to make a comedy. Um, and she was told that she couldn't make a comedy. She had to make what they call a ghetto film. <laughs> um, in other words, you're from Pakistan. There's no chance you can make a comedy. You have to make a film about what we in the West assume is the situation in Pakistan. And Mina was saying, oh, great. I can't make films about individuals. I have to make issue films. Mm -hmm. So individuals for the global north and, to get, and, 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 and issue films for the global south. So this is the situation we are confronted with. Huh? Now in India, it's interesting because if you get something, someone like Amir Khan or the films he produces, um, they're they are targeting both an Indian audience um, um, and, and an NRI audience, but also an international audience. And some of them are interesting, some of them are less interesting, but again, they have a kind of watermark on it. Um, the women are of particular types, they have to be quite chirpy, quite funny, quite cool, all of that. And I'm sure that comes from the production funding. Mm. I tell you one film I really like, which is Peeply Life. Oh yes, oh yes, mm. yes. It's got the documentary aspect to it also. Yes. But also it problematizes the, the, the it, in a very kind of interesting way. It sort of puts as a problem the media. No? It, right. it says, okay, this is this is what I'm doing, and and this. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for your. Response. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just thinking, Valentina, we should be letting you go, but Isha had a had another question. Isha, can you be? It's my answers which are very long, I'm really sorry. No, they're absolutely, it's just, it's completely fascinating. This is absolutely, yeah. I think Isha wanted to know about um, a million threads, that maybe she's gone. Isha? Is Isha still? Just need to be here. I have to. I've been talking, but I think I don't know. Somehow I was muted. Okay, uh, I'm here. Yes. Uh, well, actually, originally I had a question about the, you know, the haptic aspect of the uh, the weavers uh, that I really like to know. The, but awesome. after hearing all this wonderful discussion, and thank you for that, uh, Valentina. You know about. Uh, mainstream versus alternative, you know, I, I have a question related to that. And mm -hmm. since I study Pakistan, you know, I know a little bit more. So my questions tend to be more about the Afghan, uh, Afghanistan, you know, that, that mm. part. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm interested, you know, are we talking about, oh, before that, can I say that, you know, I loved your last comment about uh, Indian cinema, you know, that, uh, that, you know, the films being produced by Amir Khan, for instance, may be alternative in some ways, but they have certain stereotypes in them of the women, so forth. And actually, on that note, you know, lips, lipstick under the burqa. I've talked with some of my uh, Muslim colleagues and that people don't like it. You know, they uh, find it a little Islamophobic sometimes mm. so yes because and why the burqa why lipstick under the burqa i mean there were there are a couple of hindu characters there but it's not lipstick under the gungat that's right it's lipstick under the burqa you know so anyway yeah. so those stereotypes might also pop up so i loved your you know your comments on you know mainstream and you know sort of how uh, certain categories get imposed both in international film festivals and also in the so-called mainstream alternative uh, cinema mm -hmm. coming out from India. So I loved that. Thank you for that. I had a question, actually, I sort of a question and thoughts on that. You know, uh, with regards to Afghanistan, uh, 
I heard you say that uh, some of the filmmakers you're studying may be connected to the mainstream television industry. Oh. So because they come from the ba bag, uh, it's sort of elite backgrounds, there's also a big Pashto film. I'm sure you know about it, Pash and because you know your wonderful work on action cinema, total earlier work totally resonates with that. The Pashto, uh, very, very industry-based mainstream films mm -hmm. uh, that actually come out of Lahore, right? A lot of those are from Lahore. Yeah, so ha are are we looking at different mainstream uh, sort of connections with mainstream uh, that are emergent around women's cinema, particularly in the Western region? Or is that Minu's work as well? He has Minu Gors, well, a wonderful work. So are we looking at different mainstreams here? Some connect more. Yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I have enormous problems with that term. You know, I mean, it, it, may, it may just about be usable in the United States, where you do have a definite um, corporate sector, a vertical inter used to have a vertically integrated industry and all of that. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about mainstream there. But mm -hmm. then the problem is that you have a term which is used in a, in a, in a filmic config cinematic configuration, which is very specific, very mm -hmm. unique in the States. Mm -hmm. And then it's sort of slapped onto other, onto other countries where you know, the situation is completely different. So I always said that mm. to talk about the mainstream in India make, makes very little sense because which mainstream are we talking about? Is that yeah. Hindi? Is it Hindi produced in, 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 in Hyderabad? Is it, is it Hindi, um, is it the Tamil cinema? Is it, 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 I mean, what is the mainstream in a place like India? It's, it's very difficult. And in a way your question mm. just puts your finger on that, right? Mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in Pakistan, absolutely. Um, you have, you have, um, you have Pashto cinema and so, so I tend to talk about films paying lip service to or trying to get to that kind of center ground, which is where all the money with the big lumps of money circulate. And they pull in tropes that, um, may get them there somehow, but they don't have the funding to do that. And therefore they always look a bit sloppy and, and so. Mm -hmm. um, is that mainstream cinema just simply because it wants to be mainstream cinema, but it can't be mainstream cinema? Um, it isn't. You know? um, so the term is rife with problems and you could, yes, say that in Pakistan, there, has the, there are different mainstreams. Or there is no mainstream and there are trends mm. and power relations between various different um, territories, different genres, different distributors, um, you know, then it becomes complicated. Mm. But Mino uh, has always wanted to make films that, yeah. she's always been very clear, she always mm. wanted to make films that um, addressed as wide an audience as possible. Right, right, right. Yes, yes. I've spoken with Minu. She's wonderful. Yes, and, and exactly. And yeah. the irony is that she gets the money from Europe to make ghetto films. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awful. Yeah. That's that's just horrendous. <laughs> yeah, but she also got to um, represent Pakistan at the Oscar, didn't she? Right. Right. Actually, Minu told me that she had made, uh, uh, they, uh, Farjad and Minu, I have spoke with both of them, they made a, uh, a print of Zinda Bhag also for single screens, not, not oh. digital, yes. So those single screen, uh, those film, uh, they were actually shown in Multan and other provincial towns. So th they went to enormous expense. To make single, you know, celluloid print and digital as well. Wow. You know, digital, yeah. So for Zinda Bhag, they did that. So they really tried. It's wonderful, yeah. Mm, they could have put everything on a VHS and probably found some old video parlors. <laughs> that, absolutely, because there is such a parallel, uh, you know, video piracy distribution route. You know that in in Pakistan and Bang, uh, not Bangladesh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, 
lorries, uh, trucks ply. There's a whole establishment of video piracy. So they mm. could have just done that. Yes. You, so you, you, know the, that. you know the work of Lawrence Liang, who, who measured how, how long it would take for a film to be released between the time of release and the time mm. it would reach the gray market in Bangalore. Mm. China. Okay, Lawrence, yeah, no, I don't know that word. Yeah, but it, it it took the film a week, big thing. seven days. Mm. And, uh, well, in Pakistan, it gets released before it goes to the censor board mm. in pirated yeah. form. Yeah, that's what Yeah, I'm... Yeah, in, in Latin America, you get that too as well. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, but, you know, um, inevitably, a film, film is a reproducible thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, more and more easily, so. Yeah. I think we should, um, we should probably be letting Valentina go. <laughs> Quite late in the UK, but this is, this is such a wonderful discussion. It's been absolutely fantastic, this talk. I want to thank you, everybody who, who listened to me talking and, to, um, and for asking questions, which allowed me to, well, allowed us to, to go a bit more into detail into, um, into the, the, the cinemas. And I do hope that if you have students who are studying South Asian cinema, please do encourage them to look outside, outside India because there's such interesting work going on. You know, and I mean, in India too, obviously, but, uh, but uh, there's so much work that needs to be done with other countries. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day, night, afternoon, <laughs> morning, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.